Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another video with us here at LMD and STEM Academy. In this video, we will be working on question five, part C from the Cape Chemistry Unit 1 Paper 2 from June 1999. We are still on energetics. And so this specific question is starts off by asking us to define the term bond energy, right? So the bond energy, sometimes you might be see referred to as bond dissociation energy. And what that means, it is the amount of energy needed to break one mole of a particular bond in one mole of gaseous molecules. Now let's just write this out real quickly so that you can see if you're not familiar with it. Say I have a mole of methane molecules, right? That's one mole of methane molecules, right? One mole of CH4, right? So here is that structure, bam, 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 that's CH4, right? That's what CH4 looks like from a Lewis structure or a bonding diagram standpoint. Now the bond energy, right, would be the amount of energy that is required to break this particular bond, right? That would be a mole of CH bond. So that would be one mole of CH bonds. And so the CH bond itself would be the particular bond that we're breaking, okay? particular bond that we're breaking. And that bond, we would say as a, we would denote the bond energy as E for the CH bond, okay? And there's a value associated with that. And that would be its bond energy, okay, of the CH bond. So again, definition says this is the energy the bond energy is the amount of energy needed to break one mole of a particular bond in one mole of gaseous molecules, okay? So the amount of energy needed to break this one mole in this one mole of CH4, right? That would be the bond energy of CH4, okay? Uh, bond energy of CH, rather. All right, so let's clear that. And so now the next question is asking us, about, as it's saying that atmospheric nitrogen is not very reactive under normal laboratory conditions, whereas oxygen is reactive. And so they're saying now with a reference to the data booklet, they want us to explain the statement above, right? So they want us to use the data booklet to explain why is it that atmospheric nitrogen is not very reactive whereas oxygen is reactive. And they want us specifically to use a bond energy argument to be able to do that, right? And so what we have to do generally when we're doing bond energy questions and we're comparing two things, the first thing I suggest that we do is really just kind of draw the bonding picture for the elements in question or the compounds in question. And so here, we're looking at nitrogen, which is N, triple bond, N, right? So that's nitrogen. And then the oxygen would be O, double bond, O, right? They're both diatomic molecules, right? They're both diatomic molecules, but from a bonding pitch to standpoint, one has a double bond, right? You see that? That, that has a double bond, and this one has a triple bond, okay? So let's just keep that in mind, right? And when we go to our data booklet, what we see for nitrogen is that the bond energy, so I'm gonna write E of nitrogen, turns out to be 994 kilojoule per mole. So for every mole of nitrogen, nitrogen, triple bonds that I'm breaking, it's going to cost me this amount of energy. 
right? So if I have five of them to break, it's going to be five times that. But that, that's, how much, that's how much energy is required to break an N triple bond N. Now, when we go to, this, to the book, data booklet for oxygen, O double bond O, what we see is that the amount of energy required to break that O double bond O is going to be 496 kilojoule per mole. Now, when we look at the value of the bond energy for the N triple bond N and then the O double bond O, we see that, you know, roughly it's a half, right? This is roughly a thousand and this is roughly 500. So they're roughly half. The oxygen is a half the amount of energy that's required to break this bond. So it's easier to break the oxygen bond than it is to break the nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond. So here's what we can write down. We can say then that the higher the bond energy, the harder it is to break those bonds. And so that compound will be very unreactive. If we have to put in a ton of energy to break up our nitrogen bonds, it's gonna be, it's not gonna be very reactive. It's gonna be hard to get it to react because we have to do that bond breaking work before we can have any reaction. And then on the flip side now, the lower the bond energy, the easier it will be to break those bonds. And so that compound will be more reactive. Here's a low bond energy, comparatively speaking. It's going to be easier to break apart the O double bond O. And if it's easier for us to break those bonds apart, then we can have reactions proceeding, okay? And so that's why the oxygen is going to be more reactive, right, when compared to the nitrogen, all right? So the triple bond in the nitrogen has a higher bond energy, then the double bond in oxygen, hence nitrogen, is not very reactive while oxygen is reactive. All right, so that's our answer here. So let's just clear everything here and we'll move on to part C, part three. Part three says we're supposed to cite two areas where a knowledge of bond energy values is useful. So here are two areas. The first area is that it is useful in calculating the enthalpy change of a reaction. And you may remember from this section how we use bond energy to calculate enthalpy change was that we would need to add up the bonds broken, right? And we also have to add up the bonds formed right? The energy rather, total energy for the bonds broken and the total energy for the bonds formed. And that would be, would have been our delta H of that reaction, right? So that's how we can use the bond energy values to find enthalpy change. Okay, so it's a sum of the bonds broken. So sum of all the bond energies that need, are needed here, and then the sum of the bonds formed, okay? So that's what we would have done there. And so it's very useful in that respect. And then secondly, it's useful in determining the stability, as we just saw in part two, right? It's useful in determining the stability of a compound. So based on what the bond energy is, we will know whether it will be very reactive or very unreactive. And then that can help us to figure out how to store the compound. Right, because if a compound is very reactive, you know, it just kind of spontaneously reacts. You can't really store that at room temperature, right? Because it would probably just break down, right? Or something of that nature. And But if it's very unreactive or very stable because there's a high bond energy, right? There's a lot more that you can do with that in terms of storage. So just keep those things in mind, okay? All right, so now let's clear this and see what the final part is. So the final part is part D of this question. It says, which of the following reactions would you expect to be exothermic, right? So here in the first instant, we're going from steam to liquid water. So it's a change of state really. That's the only difference. We still have water, you know. But in the first case, we have gas. And in the second case, or the final state, we have liquid. So when you think about what's going on from a gas standpoint, right? When we think about gases, we know that gas molecules are like far apart, right? Like that. And specifically, as it relates to water, 
right? Let's just put on the, right, like write the entire molecule, right? So let me just have those circles be representing the oxygen, okay? So that's what water looks like from a bond, you know, pitched up perspective. So we would have in the gas phase, right? We have the water molecules being fairly far apart, right? So that's what they look like in the gas phase, H2 gas. But now, if we want to go to the liquid phase, we want that transition, what's going on is that we need to squish them closer together. Right? They need to, they're going to be closer together because that's what liquid are. They're more closely packed. And so we would then, there would have to be some kind of bonds that gets formed, some intermolecular bonds, so stronger intermolecular bonds. Um, well, essentially, when we're in the gas phase, we say there are no intermolecular forces generally, right, from kinetic theory. But if we're in the liquid phase, guys, we're going to need to have there being the formation of some intermolecular bonds. And so that would be hydrogen bonding, right? So you see that? that oxygen is gonna get then bonded to that hydrogen there. And if I have another oxygen in a neighboring water molecule here, it's gonna hydrogen bond to this neighboring one, right? So that's, those are our intermolecular bonds coming into play. This one is gonna hydrogen bond to a neighboring one as well, right? So like that, and then, Similarly, right, if there's another water molecule here, um, that's what's going to happen, right? So H there, um, bonded to a O, bonded to a H, right? So you, you get like this extended network. So let's bring, let's bond this one. Let's bond that one, hydrogen bonded to another H that has a O and an H, right? And it would just continue on like that throughout the whole thing. And then this H could come, this oxygen and this hydrogen could, you know, come in and be bonded. So essentially what's happening when we're going from a gas to a liquid is we're forming these hydrogen bonding. There are these intermolecular hydrogen bonds that are being formed. And we know that bond forming, right? Bond forming, if it is that we're gonna have to form bonds, then that means that that's going to be an exothermic process. That's a process that gives out heat. Okay, so bond forming is exothermic. And so the first one would be exothermic. Okay, now for this one, essentially what we're doing is we're going the opposite way, right? Now we're going from over here. We have these strong intermolecular hydrogen bonds and we're going back now to the gas phase. So let me show my arrow going the other way now for this part, right? For the second one, for this process, we're going that way. So we're going from liquid water where there are strong intermolecular forces, these hydrogen bonds, and we're going back to the gas phase now. So what, what are we gonna have to do, guys? We're gonna have to break up these bonds. We're gonna have to break up these hydrogen bonds so that we can now be in a free gaseous state where the water molecules are, you know, they're far apart and they're able to move very rapidly in that gas phase. So because we need to break bonds, Right. And we already touched on this in energetics, you know, just really the basis of energetics is that whenever you have these bond breaking events, right, if you have bonds that you need to break up. So we need to like just slash these guys. We're going to have to like break that. We're going to have to 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 break that. That takes energy. Right. So we're going to have to put in energy into the system. Whenever we have to put in energy into the system from the surrounding, we say that that's an endothermic process, okay? So remember now, change of state. This is a change of state kind of a process that they're really challenging us to really think critically about. We're going from gas to liquid. We're going to have to form bonds, and that's exothermic. We're going from a liquid water to a gas, we're going to have to break up those strong intermolecular hydrogen bonds that would have been in the liquid water. 
to get to the gas wall, the gaseous phase. And so that bond breaking requires energy. So that's an endothermic process, right? And so our answer here is that this one, the first one, this process, right? Let's just box that so it's clear. This process here is going to be exothermic, okay? And so with that, we have wrapped up this question. We are at the end of question five. Please, if you've made it this far, definitely like this video, comment down below to let us know if it helped you, and definitely consider subscribing to this channel. And we will see you in the next video.